welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today I'm going to be just answering some questions and reading comments from you guys and all that, and just doing a little bit of the old talky talky. Because I don't have anything in front of me right here, as far as the shout outs and all that stuff goes, we're going to do those later. But that doesn't mean um, I'm thinking you guys any less. I just want you to know that. And as far as you guys giving this show five stars on iTunes, I already know that's in your day planner. So make that happen, guys. Come on. Leave a review. If you're watching this on the tubes, leave a comment. Like it. Share it. And make sure you're fucking subscribed. Come on, people. It's just a button you push. Why is it so fucking difficult? It shouldn't be. I, uh... Just listened back to a Creeperson album that I haven't fucking listened to in years. And it was the Creeperson Go Home album. And that's just like a good fucking rock and roll record, man. Like shit. Like, uh, um, the quick little story on that was that it was written and the recording was started while we were on tour in 2011 and we were touring in an RV that we got at one of those like 1-800 RV places or whatever and or it was Cruise America we got a Cruise America RV when I was driving I was driving but when someone else was driving I was in the back or in the passenger seat with this little tiny travel guitar that Gary had brought to practice on in the RV, like in between towns and shit. I started writing all these songs about like the experiences we were having while we were on tour. And so Gary's like, um, I have like everything I would need to record so why don't you like record like scratch tracks of all this stuff so on this little dinky guitar I recorded and I remember doing the final recording of everything in between Albuquerque and Phoenix when we were um, that's where the shit happened so we were trying to get to our Phoenix show and I remember I think D was driving. I think D was driving. And so um, I was in the little nook, breakfast nook area, sitting on one side with the guitar, and Gary was sitting across the table from me with his um, computer and shit. And he would, like, set up a click track. Like, I would, like, pluck the strings, like, how fast it was going to go, and he would find a metronome time that would fit like a bpm and then i would just record the songs and it was funny that we did it like that and at one part when we were going through like i think it's sonoma or something i don't know it's like really hilly and windy roads i'm like trying to record these songs and i'm like going back and forth like fucking crazy trying to like play all this shit and then gary had the idea of making those janky guitar riffs the scratch tracks be like the main guitar track on the album and I thought it was kind of a cool idea but when I listen back to the album now it definitely has a different sound than any other album we made because of that guitar sound and um, it was just weird because it, like, I haven't listened to that album in years. And hearing it, knowing that that's what the guitar is, it it's so different. Like, Creeperson always had, like, this really, like, heavy, distorted guitar sound. And on this one, that kind of twangy just overdrive gain guitar is all there is and i mean there's other distorted guitars like layered behind it but that's always up at the front 
and I think it works really well on some songs and others not so much. But um, that was just like a really fun album to make because honestly, that was another one. I think we played Dead in Omaha and maybe Titty Monster. But the rest of the songs on that album, I don't think we ever played live. It was just like, these were the songs we wrote on tour, or I wrote on tour. And then Gary put his stuff on, D came in and put his stuff on, Greg came in and put his stuff on. And it was just so separated compared to the other stuff we had done. I don't know. Just an interesting little um, thought that was going on. But yeah, so that was that. So let, let's let's get to some questions or comments. Oh, Bunny has a nice little comment here um, about the last podcast episode about passion and poetry. I think passion comes from a place in you where the best art comes from. And you you can't put it any better way than that. Like, that's exactly it. Another thing that's been going on lately is I did a video um, about what I feel like is the most important book for artists, creatives, writers, musicians, filmmakers, painters, sculptors, blah, 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 blah any kind of artist and it's a book I just found it just came out um, it's by Rick Rubin and it's called The Creative Act I, you guys should all go get it if you are an artist of any kind get it the book is like I agree with so much of it but I still learn stuff from it I'm on my second read through of it now and it's just illuminating Jessica, the soft-spoken poet, said, I'm excited. I love doing the Julia Cameron stuff, but I'm interested in seeing how he pairs spiritual spirituality with artistry. And, dude, it's like the way he pairs it is that basically there is no artistry without the spiritual. There is there's something to be said about that. And depending on what you believe in and what your religious beliefs are and all this other stuff, like you can say however you want to say it. Inspiration comes from somewhere, you know, and it's not something that you can necessarily put your finger on. And unless you've had like huge creative spurts where it's almost like you're, channeling something from another place now a lot of like hardcore fundamentalist christians are like oh this is satan this is satan or it's just there's a collective consciousness there is um the ether there is the universe all of this shit so um it just however you see that chill baby left a comment on um an older video on how to title a collection of poetry stories. And maybe I'll do a podcast episode about that because that's been a while since I hit that. And Chill Baby says, I get annoyed with titles. I don't want to add more words to my shit, which is funny because I can be a little verbose. But I said what I wanted to say. It's finished now. I don't give a fuck what you call it. When I visualize my poems in a book, it doesn't usually involve titles. I'm getting better at using it as a clever tool, but it's seriously my least favorite thing. And I totally understand that. And a lot of people, um, there are a lot of people who don't like to title their poems. And people will go back to, well, Horace didn't title his poems, and Shakespeare didn't, and Emily Dickinson didn't, and all this other stuff. And that's fine if you want to do that. Steve Richmond didn't. Um, title a lot of his poems um, he had like one title and he called every poem that one title and so it's like oh, that's kind of fucking confusing there, there's two things here one for marketing and one for you as an artist on a marketing standpoint the title is very important because the title helps the um, publisher 
tell people what this book is and what it's about, something to grab their attention. And then as for the artist, it's difficult, but I I like titles because it's an, a way for me to know what poem is what and what poem's about what. You can give too much away with a title to the point where the poem itself is almost useless if your title is too good. So when you're titling a poem, I would say make the title invocative of something, but also leaving more to be desired. And if you give too much, the poem's useless. And what a lot of people do, and I've done this, and I do it on certain poems if I feel like that's the important part, but a lot of people will use the last line of a poem as the title. But when you do that, and if your poem is too one-dimensional, you give away your twist. You give away the thing at the end of the poem. So I, I would highly take people and push them away from doing that. Um, but I feel like I can do that when the poem is so long that I feel like there's enough in the poem that will make someone forget what the title was while they're reading it and then nail that last line as the title. And then they're like, oh, because they read it originally. And then titling a collection, that's a whole other thing. And we can get into that at a later date. Um, I'll have to write that down so I remember to do that. So um, Datman asked me, can I recommend any good literature podcasts? And I responded, I'm like, besides mine, ahem. Um, I really like Slee Ricketts and Poetry Says, um, which I do. And Breaking Form is pretty good, too. It is an acquired taste, which they say on the show. Um, it's not for everyone. Um, but if you're into just more literature, like, and especially into more pulpy stuff, I think Elder Sign is a fantastic podcast. It's really, really good. Um, and then there's, like, the H.P. Lovecraft podcast, or the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast was really good way back in the day when it started and then they changed how they do stuff and then most of their stuff's behind a paywall um and so i stopped listening to that but i remember when the podcast started i really enjoyed it um and then there was uh chromecast which focuses on robert e howard stuff that's really good but again, as the show's been going, um, like you have to like those guys and they're very likable. So if you like the guys, the shows are good, but if you don't, then they're kind of like lackluster sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think of some other really good ones. The self-publishing podcast back like 10 years ago was amazing. Um, but most of the stuff they talked about or talk about, um, I actually haven't listened to that in forever. I don't even know if it still exists. But a lot of that stuff is probably dated now. And a lot of what they were doing writing-wise the last few times I listened to it a couple of years ago, they were basically writing properties with the idea of trying to get them turned into TV shows or movies. And um, that whole thing just felt weird to me. That's the kind of shit that I'm into. So poetry and pulp. So there you go. Uh, here's something from the open book. Ugh, I have to fucking... If you're hearing this, I need to send you an email. Um, I keep forgetting. I'm really sorry about that. But she says, I'm a bit baffled by how illegible some covers are that are put out in indie as a collaboration and like more than one person looked at it and said, yeah, that's fine. When it's not fine, what am I reading? Um, this was on my video that said, is your book cover trash? Now here's the thing that a lot of people don't 
forget about book covers because of how books are sold now um especially with amazon your book cover has to look good in a sea of book covers in the size of a thumbnail okay so if your book cover in a thumbnail you can't tell what the picture is you can't tell what it says um it just looks like a mess that's not a good cover okay like every genre has elements and when you're making a book cover you have to make it with those elements even those color schemes depending on genre and then look at it in a, the smallest picture you can and see if you understand what that is because if you don't no one's ever going to read your book because no one will ever find it so that's just not necessarily poetry based but can be um, implied into that just a lot of people saying nice stuff ab about some of the videos I do so I appreciate that and then <laughs> I got a comment here from bookish talking about how um, the city was tearing up the street outside my window and he's like I hope it's over by now and um, yeah I still had like two days after that um, and this was a question from the um, Poetic Anarchy workshop, the free workshop. If people debate the meaning of a poem, couldn't it also mean that you've captured such a string that pulls everyone in a different way? I love writing that could be interpreted on multiple levels. If all of the levels attribute to the energy I want to send. I've gotten into squabbles over what a poem was talking about with people that are convinced that a writer had a singular message. Part of my play with poetry is working on multiple dimensions at once, intertwining analogies, and I like it to flow because that's how it comes out of me. I think the main question here is if people deb are debating the meaning of a poem, couldn't it also mean you captured such a string that pulls everyone in a different way? Thanks, asshole car fuck. Um, yeah, and that is a way of looking at it. When people are debating the meaning of a poem, like, that means it could fucking mean anything. I think where I get frustrated with this is when they're... And again, it doesn't matter. If people are talking about poetry, shut the fuck up, me. Let them fucking argue about it. As a poet, what pisses me off, and this is like going to be a very personal thing here, is when people tell me what my poems mean and when they're fucking wrong. And then I tell them they're wrong. And they're like, no, I really think this is what you were meaning deep down. That kind of shit drives me fucking crazy. And the reason for it is because, like, yes, I will throw a metaphor in. I will, like, allude to certain things. But for the most part, I am very fucking cut and dry with my poetry. It means what it means. Like, it says what it says. I say what I mean and I mean what I say, you know? I talked about this before a while ago, where somebody hit me up and said, maybe I didn't talk about this on here. Maybe it was just in conversation. Somebody hit me up and said that they have a hard time reading my poetry because they know that all my poems are really about my kid. And since they don't have kids, they can't relate. And so right off the bat, I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, that's not true. Do I have poems about my kid? Yes. Is it a lot? No. It's like maybe one out of every book could maybe be about my kid. And this, I say maybe because I don't remember if there's even that many poems about my kid. My kid doesn't like it when I write about my kid, so I try not to write about my kid. You know, there's times when I've sent, like, just, like, I've written poems that were, like, kind of, like, love letters to my kid. 
you know. But again, it hardly ever happens. Most of my poetry is about the world I see outside or about drinking or about sex or about fighting or about just being a fucking degenerate, you know. My poem is a reflection of the world I see. And so when someone said that they can't relate to my work because all of my work is really about my children, it like fucking like blew my mind. It blew my mind because I couldn't fucking believe that somebody would actually think that. Because to me, my thought is, oh, you're really going through some shit about you not having kids. Like, are you reaching the age where your, like, pipes aren't going to work anymore? And you are really, like, on this thing. Like, if I don't have a kid within the next year, it's never going to happen. Because I don't know how you reading a poem about a fucking homeless dude jerking off on the street is somehow about my kid. Like, it just boggles my fucking mind. I just don't get it. So that's one thing. Oh, and here's a good story. And it kind of goes back to another question about the titles and stuff. So I sent some poems to this magazine. And it was kind of a, a bigger, a bigger middle-of-the-road magazine. And... I think I sent them like three poems, but the first poem I sent them, and I probably have talked about this before, but it's a poem called The Eyes of a Predator. I'm almost positive I've talked about this before, but whatever. So that was the title, The Eyes of a Predator. And in the poem, I was talking about how I have eyes of a predator, meaning my eyes are on the front of my head, on the front of my skull. I look directly out whereas prey animals their eyes are on the sides of their head so they can see stuff coming from all different directions okay and the poem was about how i wished i had eyes on each side of my head like eyes of prey so i could just take in more okay so i i got a pretty immediate response from this magazine and they said um you know we are declining these poems and the reason is because this is a safe space and we are all um, inclusive of everyone and we don't want to make anyone feel scared or awkward or um in danger or anything like that so we are not going to take your poems and I was like, what the fuck? And I, it took me a minute. I'm like, what are they even fucking talking about? And so I read through the poems, and I'm like, there's nothing in any of these poems. I don't even say bitch or nothing. Like, it was just like, they were just three fucking poems. And I couldn't fucking put it together. And then when I saw how the email looked with the three poems in it, when you look at the email file it says eyes of a predator like that's the only thing it says on the actual file and then i was like oh shit like they think i'm sending them a poem about being a predator like maybe a sexual predator or something like that and i don't think they read the fucking poems i really don't fucking think so because I don't know why they would have fucking said what they said in that rejection if they had. But that's another example of what a title can do to your poem. And that's also another situation of someone trying to, like, tell you what your fucking poem's about. Maybe they read it and really thought that what I was saying was, like, I wish I had multiple eyes so I could watch you in a creepy way doubly. I don't fucking know, dude. People are fucking weird. Ugh. But anyway, so um, thank you for that comment. 
Okay, on the last episode, Soft Spoken Poet said, Oh my God, I do automatic writing to do a lot of my poems. It's like I space out and the words just spill. And I get that feeling like, is it really that easy? And then I try to make it complicated. Yeah, totally. Compl- Ugh, that's, I yeah. I do it. Everyone does it. It's one of those things. Um, basically, a question... It was a, a longer question, but the question, like, basically said, what do you do with a short film? Like, what would you do with a short film? And I honestly have been kind of out of the film distribution loop for some time now. I don't know what the best thing to do with short feature, short films are. Other than doing the festival circuit because when people make a short film it's usually as a calling card for what they can do so the way to get more work out of a short film is to do the circuit try to get into sundance get into slam dance get into um all like shit i don't even know um film festivals anymore there's a bunch with initials. I used to judge one of them. You got to get into those things so people can see what you can do. And then also, it's a way to kind of try to level your game up because when you're there, you will see what other people who are kind of competing for work against you do. And if some of that stuff, like if you see, like, oh wow, all these people, their movies, like, look better than mine do what cameras are they using um this short sounded so much better than mine like what mics are they using what kind of um post-production software do they use is there anything i can do to make my stuff better you know and go through all this and um figure all that shit out but on top of it if you are trying to get work in feature films, you need to put your short in a place where producers and agents who make all that shit happen are going to be. And the best way to do that is submitting to festivals where you know they're going to be at. And it costs money. And it costs money to travel to all these places. But if you want to be a filmmaker, like as a profession... This is the kind of shit you have to do. Now, if you are making short films because you are an artist, I would say put it on YouTube. Like, don't worry about any fucking um, distribution bullshit. This is like the age-old thing. Like, the only place to actually make money in film is in distribution. And if you are not a distributor, you are not going to make money. So, like, a lot of producers who throw money into movies probably are not going to see a return on investment. That's just the, the truth of the matter. The only people who are going to make money off of that movie are the people who distribute the film. So, if you put your film on YouTube and you meet all the requirements, you have a thousand subs, you can monetize and do all that shit... Start doing that. Or you could even put it in, like, I don't know if DistroKid does film distribution, but I'm sure there's places like that who will put your content up on other platforms where the platforms are monetized and you get some money off of that. But at the end of the day, now that distributor is making all the money. If you were to put the video up on YouTube yourself, you are then basically the distributor and YouTube is the store. So the store is going to take their cut and then you're going to get your cut. Um, and if you're trying to make art, but also be able to pay investors back and all this other shit, that's the best way to do it. Like I would lo love, I would love, love, love to get the rights to all my movies back and put them up on my YouTube channel. That would be fucking amazing. And, like, a lot of those movies that I've never made a fucking dime on, I would like to be able to make a couple bucks on. But, again, 
all of that is me getting a lawyer to go to all these distributors that still have my movies technically um, and try to get them back. So I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever do it because I'm kind of over it. Like I love the fact that I made movies. I love the movies I made, especially when I was making them. You know, like I'm in a different place now. But for you, putting your films on YouTube and learning how to market yourself and do all that stuff is really good. And if you're doing this for the art, putting it on YouTube is the best way for someone to be able to see your art. And hopefully you could also make a couple bucks on it too. But if you want to work in film, you need to be at the festivals, you need to be at the film markets, you need to be doing all that stuff. Because short films do not make any money. Short films are a resume. Okay, that's it. So look at it like that um another question the anarchy crew is outdated that is more of a statement so um i will answer this question um or the statement so basically what was said here was that going to the um the free workshop because it was a live stream and it was filmed last summer when the streams happened and i'm talking to the people there and it took place in the past it feels dated the person who wrote in said that like they didn't even know if they should be doing anything because it's already been done if i need to go in again and remake those as just videos to put into the poetic anarchy course thing i'll do that that's actually not a bad idea but the actual free workshop yes it was live streamed yes people were in the comments talking and yes all of that stuff but it still was what the lessons are and you can still do the lessons and still um, do the work and still learn something from it but um, I'm probably going to be doing another um, free workshop and I was planning on doing it as a live stream but now I don't know if I should do it like that maybe I should just put the videos up um, so something like this doesn't come up again so let me know what you think like do you think um, if you've done the workshop, did you feel like because it was a live stream that it was like old news? Like, what do you think um, that would be? Like, let me know about that. And thank you for the criticism. Like, I take that. So if that's something that I need to do to make people feel more welcome in the thing and doing the work, then fuck, I'll do it. That's not a problem at all. And then finally, I have a question here. Um, and I might have, I don't think I hit this up last time, but the question is, and I think this is from Andrew, it says, why your voice must be heard, I guess is the best way, that's how it's written, why your voice must be heard. Here's the thing, if you are going to take the time to create something, why would you do it in a, the voice of someone else? Why would you do it? without people being able to know your inner being, I guess is the best way to say that. Your your voice is like your fingerprint, you know? It's unique, it's, it's you. It's how people can find you. If you, I mean, if we wanna take that analogy further, if you don't want your voice to be heard in your work, then I guess that's like, wearing gloves so you don't leave prints and when you think about burglars and robbers wearing gloves so they don't leave prints they're doing that because they're trying to be elusive they're trying to be um, hidden they're trying to not be found out and I feel like when writers and poets do that it's blatant you can see that someone is hiding. So if you like hiding behind your words and all that shit, that's you, okay? And that's fine if that's how you feel. Just know that you feeling like that, I'm going to look at you as you trying to be deceptive, as you hiding something, and you not being honest with your work, and most importantly, at that point, honest with me. 
that's why I feel like your voice must be heard as a creator. So hopefully that answered your question there. And I think those are all the questions. Yeah, I guess that's it. Now, let's get to the butt plugs. Okay. So, a few things right off the bat. It has been like three days since I recorded that. Maybe four. I, like an idiot, thought I had already done it. And so I was doing my thing, editing, 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 and then realized I hadn't done the butt plugs yet. So I'm like, oh, okay, I will do those tomorrow. Tomorrow came and went. I completely forgot. I was doing other things, which will probably be um, another podcast episode explaining all the shit that I've been doing lately. Then I was about to put the podcast up again, and I started looking through it, and I was like, Oh my God, I still haven't done the butt plugs. You know what else didn't get done? Because of how this video or podcast started, I never did the shout outs. So here we go with the motherfucking shout outs. So I want to give a big thank you to those motherfuckers over at Patreon. I want to give a thank you to Chase, to Michael, to Deborah, to Cedar, to Harry. Thank you guys so much. You guys are awesome. Now over to the YouTube thank you crew who make podcasts like this possible. I want to give a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to JH. And I want to give some thank yous to uh, some new folks in the fold. Jan and Chill Baby. Chill Baby. Chill Baby. Um, And then over at the Anarchy crew... I want to give some thank yous to the Big Man Majamas. So I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Hannah, to Thomas, to Tim, to Lisa, to Josh, to Alan, to Jessica, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, and to our newest member of the Anarchy Crew, Tim. Another Tim. And then I want to give a biggest, the biggest, biggest, biggest thank you to the number one chappie, over there doing what's right, knowing what to do, the motherfucking SDG. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Um, I don't think I forgot anyone. There have been a bunch of new people in here, so hopefully that is all good. And since we're now into butt plug territory, go pick up my newest chat book, Off the Grid. Limited to 26 copies. All signed and numbered. Each one has a unique cover. So every single issue of this chapbook is one of a kind. This is the only one of my chapbooks that you could say that about. So awesome, awesome, awesome. But there is bigger news, folks. Bigger news. Are you ready for the bigger news? I need a cup of coffee. You're going to have to wait a second. That is hot. Good Lord. All right. All right, so here we go. Bigger news. Poetic Anarchy Volume 3 is out now. What I'm holding here, if you were watching this on the video feed, is the proof copy. But this book is out now on Amazon. And what this is, this is poetry from the people who took the um, free workshop for that. It was a week-long workshop every day during the summer. And these are the poems that those people wrote. And a lot of these names are going to sound familiar to you guys. So in this book, you have poems by Bunny Wild, Nate Colton, Mindy Simonson, Tim Johnston, Thomas Crop, Hannah Fletcher, Garrett Carroll, O'Marie, and me, Matt Wall. All in one fancy lime-ass green fucking paperback book with the website on the back so poetic anarchy volume three out now get it before it gets you and get it before springtime when poetic anarchy volume four will appear and um i guess i could tell you a little bit about that because i got some people ready to go so obviously i will be partaking in that but also bunny wild We'll be back for volume four. 
Mindy Simmonson will be back for Volume 4. Shaylin Effin Marks will be in Volume 4. So that is just a sneak peek of what you're going to be getting. And if you would like to be in the Poetic Anarchy anthologies, if you would like to partake in all of this bread that the carb king known as me is giving forth. God, this is awful already. Go to PoeticAnarchy.com, do the free workshop, jump from the free workshop into the Poetic Anarchy playlist on my YouTube channel. You're going to have to join to do that, but just join the Anarchy crew tier and you will get over 100 videos of ass kicking fucking videos on how to fucking kick ass and write poetry. So there you go. All done. So anything else, um, if you want to do mentorship, you could go to IHateMattWall.com slash mentorship. Find out about that. If you have any questions, you want to talk to me, if you want to have one-on-one -on -one with me and go over some shit, we can do that. Yeah, I'm going to be recording the new album here soon, and I have a big, giant, huge gargantuan announcement that I'm going to be making here um, within the next couple weeks that I am really excited about. And other than that, guys, keep buying my books, type hard, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.